in order to sell something, it's not about just knowing how to use Twitter. You know what I mean? You got to know exactly your demographic. You got to know their, their, the way that they use um, uh, the internet, how they go ahead and, you know, just what their daily basis is like. Hi, Brian here. Welcome to another episode of Leading Questions, and I'm so excited to introduce everyone to Reggie. Hello, Reggie. Welcome to the show. Brian, how's it going, man? Good, good. I'm so excited to be chatting with you. You're one of the uh, most creative advertisers, marketers that I've worked with, and I love your Thanks. energy. And our time working together was was pretty fun and interesting in terms of, um, I, re- I still remember to this day, you know, uh, making, making stuff weird, you know, make it weird. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I remember that we were in a meeting and, and I think that, I don't know, I was going through my, uh, probably a spiel that I always go through or something like that, but it's just in general, I think that's the way I look at marketing. You, you, when you, when you do marketing and you come up with creative ideas, you got to start weird and scale it back if you need to, but that's mm-hmm. generally where creativity comes from. Thanks, man. It's awesome working with you as well, too. Oh, by the way, it was awesome work because at the end of the day, like you, you're very much, um, you know how to shift back and forth between being super data driven and really like following numbers and and being able to to, to shift over to the, the creative side of being able to figure out the, um, you know, the copy and the ad copy and et cetera. So it's definitely a pleasure working with you in the past, but definitely not going to be the last time. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, I feel like I'm going to start turning red soon. <laughs> Uh, but you didn't have a beer yet. <laughs> At least that's the, the Asian genes. Remember, we always we have. <laughs> I, I'm I'm I don't drink anymore. But if I were to drink, I think I'll be I'll be okay. I I don't get really get flushed when I uh, when I drink. No, I do. I definitely do. Sometimes, sometimes. For for those who don't know you, um, could you tell us about yourself? Uh, what has your journey like been like as an entrepreneur or marketer? Um, tell us a bit about yourself. So, wow. So as a marketer, um, it's been about 14 years now I've been in marketing. Um, you know, I originally started uh, in computer science, actually. Um, and I did a few years there. And, and, and after a while, I realized that, you know, coding really wasn't the thing that made me tick. And, and you know, it didn't really match my personality, maybe, or maybe it just, I just felt like there was something else out there. So, you know, I'm originally from St. John, New Brunswick. And, um, you know, the old small town. And um, at some point, I just decided, you know what, I think it's time to do something completely, completely different. Um, and oddly enough, everyone thought I was from Toronto anyway out there. So I don't know why. But but generally speaking, um, you know, I just I just, you know, just packed up my bags, moved to Toronto, enrolled at George Brown College. I went to business marketing, um, finished a couple of years there as well as uh, as well as uh, the co-op program. And, and I think that, you know, I had some great opportunities to, to work with, like, you know, this, uh, at City Hall, as well as at, uh, you know, in the corporate field as well. Um, and, you know, like, it's almost like a pretty, pretty standard path, if anything. But then, you know, I'd say blessing in disguise, and we could probably talk about this in more detail. Uh, but the recession hit in 2008, and that really changed the, the direction I was going. And, and I ended up kind of like taking a little bit uh, a, a different path towards marketing, where I started working instead with just small businesses, startups, um, you know, uh, with with different medium-sized companies and, and people of all walks of life all over across the world. Um, my skill set at the time, I had actually shifted from traditional marketing to digital marketing, which was at, at its infancy at the time. And from there, uh, you know, I, 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 I took that as an opportunity to try a whole bunch of different skills. So, you know, I ended up becoming a very much like a growth hacker, having a jack of all trades sort of situation where, you know, I learned a little bit about email marketing. Then I learned a lot about email marketing, same with social media, same with writing blog posts, same with writing, um, same with SEO and, you know, just taking a strategic element towards it all, um, which, uh, you know, uh, I inevitably found a, a good niche um, in the spot related to fintech. And that's where we, you know, uh, kind of where we met as well too. Um, but, you know, that area, cryptocurrency, any area that relates to technology and utilizing it to 
to optimize um, has really been the best place for me, I think, lately, um, as well as being able to, to, to explore my own creativity of writing. I love to write. Um, and, and I love to be able to share what I've learned so far on my journey. Um, yeah, totally. We can go more detail about it, but it's, it's been a fun ride. Let's just say that. Yeah. And I know your journey, you've always been very entrepreneurial. You've always been very, um, kind of hustler mentality, just like me. My, um, and so I attribute my hustler mentality to, to my dad. Like he, he's, he's been, um, an entrepreneur his entire life, trying to make a buck here and there. Um, at every turn, basically. Um, and you've mentioned a few things, right? You're from a small town. Um, you also kind of went into the workforce when the recession hit. Um, but how, how much of that uh, environment, so for example, your physical environment, as well as the social economic ev- environment of your kind of, you know, coming up in the business world, um, how, how has that shaped your your journey and your, your kind of um, take on entrepreneurship? It's a good question. Um, so St. John, New Brunswick is very much a blue collar town. You know what I mean? Beautiful, beautiful uh, city, small city, um, the oldest city in Canada. So we say, um, and, and, you know, for that reason, like, you know, like much like my parents were just much like a lot of other parents, which is, you know, they, uh, like much of the boomer generation, they, you know, like got out of school, they worked at a, they, they, they went to university, they got a job, and then they stayed at the job for like 30, 40 years, who knows, whatever, right? And, and you know, it's it's a very um, linear way of, of, of going through life. And that's awesome. I, I have nothing wrong with that. I think that's, that's fantastic. It's, you get to focus on more important things like family and such when that happens. But in the current generation that we're running through right now, there's just too many career changes. Like at the end of the day, like we start with a company, we may be there for a couple of years. Chances are we might even not even start full time. Might have to start by showing your, your worth by contracting. Um, and, you know, just that problem with that is that it, it, you don't get the, the solidarity of being able to say that you work somewhere and you don't get the, that sort of, um, you have a little bit of that, that, that party that feels like, you know, is tomorrow going to be the same as yesterday? You know what I mean? Is it going to be a situation where um, I'm going to have to find another place, right? And or maybe even change career professions for that matter, right? I think that they said that, um, I think it's something where I saw the statistic was like 15, I think currently there are about, I think people that are in the workforce change careers about, change jobs about 15 times uh, until they retire, which is just ugly, you know? And, and you know, my parents were, were definitely like they worked for you know, my mom. Uh, she's a uh, works in the hematology uh, in the hospital. My my uh, dad's an accountant, uh, and so like you know, they, they they may not have had the entrepreneurial uh, background like your dad uh, definitely has. Um, they they definitely gave me the right proper upbringing to be able to have the structure to put myself wherever I want to be. Um, but you know, I would probably say the time where I really understood entrepreneurship was, you know, when I went on my corporate stint, um, kind of like what I talked about earlier, I worked there for two years, but I worked there over three to six month contract extensions. So while other people were coming in, getting hired full time, I was still a contract employee. Right. And they, I think they had extended me probably like six times or something like that. And that, at that point, I was like, come on, guys, like, I just, where's the benefits? You know, <laughs> Can I get like some kind of like, you know, whatever. And then 2008 happened, the recession. And the first thing that happened was all the contracts got cut. And so like, you know, that to me, that that put me in a place where it's like, OK, well, you know, if. First off, this is what it's like in the city. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's definitely different from where I'm from. So I had to kind of pave my own path a little bit, right? So, so you know, I had the opportunity to um, help out at God Style, which is a menswear store in King West. And that opened a lot of doors wearing a lot of hats. I, I wrote about that there this week, just in terms of should you wear a lot of hats as a marketer? And, and you know, I think it's a really important thing because you end up learning a lot of skills um, in the process. And, and with that opportunity, um, that allowed me to do a few things. One, 
it allowed me to go ahead and learn different skills. So I was writing blog posts initially. Then it became social media management before anyone knew what social media was. Um, then became like, you know, uh, designing the email newsletters, you know, rebuilding the website to like, you know, working with other external contractors to do anything from build apps to build video games to event marketing and, and, and other aspects of, of it that I wore so many hats that I learned so many things that I ended up taking those skills and taking it across King West. At one point, I was literally... Um, I was, I was doing the goth style thing uh, doing the menswear stuff. Um, and then I was also designing all the club flyers in King West for a while. Um, and then I was also working, uh, with a tattoo shop on King West as well, too, doing their, their marketing as well, as well as a, a, a few restaurants as well, too, in King West. So I literally was like all the way down King West, just whatever business I, I had something like had my hands in. Right. So, you know, I think that, that, that having that sort of flexibility and freedom to be able to work at work and help different businesses in an area it, it felt pretty good um and you know at the same time also was doing a lot of like blogging and i did I, I got the into the influencer realm before they called it influencers um and so around that time i also started writing my own blog i started to you know i started my own twitter account and i started to just kind of like get you know tell stories kind of like you know how a lot of my um uh, marketer daily newsletters include personal stories. Uh, my blogging background came from the fact that I actually wanted to write personal stories. Um, and it got picked up and I ended up, uh, you know, getting picked up by a bunch of PR, uh, companies and ended up working with a whole bunch of, um, uh, different, different brands, like global brands. I was working with Google and Nokia and, and Blackberry when, when it was Blackberry, uh, and, uh, and Jack Daniels and like, you know, Glenn Livett and, and like Phillips and like the source, I honestly, I could name every, I, I'd done an activation with them based on, you know, just, just utilizing my, my network. Um, I don't do it as much anymore. It's just at the end of the day, it's, it's not really my, my career focus. It's definitely something fun to do uh, is to write uh, as you know, but, um, it, finding that sort of flexibility and freedom, whether it was client work, or whether it was something that was, that was a hobby, originally a hobby that ended up turning into a, a, a something much bigger. Um, it really, really set the tone for what um, what was a much different lifestyle than I thought it was going to be when I was working in the in the corporate the scene, right? Yeah, for sure. I feel like I can draw some parallels in terms of my journey as well. Um, I literally just wrote down, jotted here. Um, there are many paths to the final destination. And I feel, um, you know, there's, there's one, one path where it's very linear, you know, for, I have, a, you know, coming out of school, I went to a business undergraduate, um, business and biochemistry. So on my business side, a bunch of my friends, I would say like almost 50, 50, a bunch of them, um, went on to become very successful in, in the banking and finance industry. Um, they're, you know, they're accountants at the big four, uh, and then there's 50% of those people who are, um, who are entrepreneurial where they, they have their own startup. They, you know, they, they went on to work for startups. Uh, and on my science side, it was basically like everybody just went on to do their masters. Some of them are now doctors. Some of them are, you know, doing research. So I can sort of see like that's linear path, um, to, to their destination. But there are also people like me where, um, you know, there's kind of a linear path and then we stray off the path a little bit, uh, put on a different hat, learn a different type of skill. You know, maybe uh, I, I almost see it as like crisscrossing this main line where um, you're kind of on the periphery, but you're still kind of um, following the general trajectory. And that's sort of how I would describe myself. I've always had like um, a full time position at ad agencies. But I've always like dabbled in my spare time in other things. So I, I was just chatting with someone who um, this isn't actually my first YouTube project. Um, I about 10 years ago, I started a YouTube channel about uh, relationship advice. And and this was like, you, yeah, it was YouTube in its infancy. And there's no such thing as, you know, um, relationship YouTube channels back then. It was all just cat videos and um, funny things. It was almost like American, uh, Americans, America's funniest videos, home videos type of scenario. Uh, we had a cast, you know, people playing character caricatures of themselves, um, and you know, providing different uh, perspectives on relationships on this talk show. Right? We went around Toronto um, interviewing people, 
I think we produced like four or five episodes, didn't really get anywhere. Uh, but all of that is to say uh, it's okay. And I feel like um, your your latest um, or one of your uh, past email newsletter um, uh, emails, one of the past, um, uh, what would you call it? Yeah, posts. Substack is Substack is interesting. It's it's like an email and it's a post. I know what you mean. It's 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 something. That that post about um you know being the um, jack of all trades and master of none, or wanting to wear multiple hats. So I read every one of them. Um, Thank you. Both Thank of you. those um, really resonate with me because there was a point in my in my career where I wanted to wear all the hats, right? Um, and I think it's there's nothing wrong with that. And I got to a point where I, I, I can choose whether to continue wearing multiple hats or specialized. And as you know, I chose to specialize in Google ads. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that is um, I wanted to be a skilled tradesperson, basically. And, and again, mm-hmm. there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's just multiple paths to the final destination. Um, Looking back, do you think um, can, like wearing multiple hats uh, was was a benefit, or d- would you did you, or do you look back and think, oh, maybe I should have um, specialized? Well, I'm glad you say that too, because because that was a point of topic I was thinking about late last week that you know I wanted to write about. Um, mm-hmm. I think wearing a lot of hats gives you a lot of understanding about what happens around you, um, and especially if you have a goal of of managing your own department, your team, or even just managing your own company. It's mm-hmm. good to have some kind of understanding about things before you go ahead and just start hiring people left and right, even though you've only really known one thing. So like, for instance, like if it, by, by, by learning the, the, the fact that you have, um, say like for myself, I, I started off and I, I, I think I started off writing, blog posts. Then I went to social media and I was running down the street and I was telling everyone, you guys are all going to see social media icons wrapped on people's cars. And everyone thought it was crazy. And then literally Mm -hmm. five years later, everyone's got a sticker on their car that has their social media icon or username on it. Right. Um, There's, but then, you know, I didn't want to be just a social media person either. I, I ended up writing newsletters and designing newsletters. I have a computer science background. So, so utilizing that HTML knowledge, I was able to go ahead and not only build better newsletters because of it, but I was also be able, I was always also able to, to, to build dozens of websites for, for different, you know, you know, entrepreneurs for small businesses mm-hmm. um, and even medium sized businesses. I was able to go ahead and build websites for them. Um, and on top of that, you know, as I'm building the website, um, there's SEO. You know, at the end of the day, mm-hmm. the, a lot of business, especially organic, runs through SEO. And there's a lot of principles, and it's not just principles, but principles that change on a, on a monthly basis sometimes, right? So having right. that knowledge, learning that as well, um, I found that, that that path where I just ended up wearing a lot of different hats, trying on different things, there's something important about learning. And learning allows you to just, first off, feel more confident with what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, uh, you know, it, it leads in a few places, like... I started to like to do the whole jack of all trades thing because um, I don't know. I got a bit of a know it all mentality. I don't know. <laughs> at, at the, you're at you're at the pretty time. good at it, though. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, maybe I was younger. I probably just pursued it, probably because I wanted to appear like I was smarter or something like that. But you know, if mm-hmm. someone started to get real technical about the intricacies of 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 um, I don't know, uh, domain rankings and stuff like that. And my knowledge of SEO was still at a preliminary level. I would kind of, you know, stop. Right. So I didn't want to have that. I wanted to know a lot about everything. And so I just kept Mm -hmm. learning and learning and learning as much as I could to the point where I just kind of found what I liked the best. And it's like, if I picture myself doing social media for a living, I wouldn't like it. If I picture myself doing SEO for a living, I wouldn't like it. But from being able to look at it from an entrepreneurial perspective, being able to see it as, well, what's the whole picture look like? You know what I mean? Like, how do we move this whole picture? A lot of the times, in order to sell something, it's not about just knowing how to use Twitter. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got to know exactly your demographic. You got to know their, their the way that they use um, uh, the internet, how they go ahead and, you know, just what their daily basis is like. And by doing that, you need to know every every possible funnel that they could come through. So if that means Google ads, for instance, that's the channel that you need to use. Um, But, you know, I think that as you're doing that as a marketer, you kind of also figure out at some point, as like you figured out too, that being a jack of all trades, 
it, it, while it might get you some jobs here and there that, you know, when you need to kind of fill, fill the time or when you want to do a career transition, you got that. Um, you want to be great at something. You got to pick one thing mm-hmm. to be exceptionally good at. It could mean just picking a niche or an industry and then just bringing all your talent to it and just being really good in that industry. It could be mm-hmm. like yourself picking one specific trade or skill and being exceptionally good at it while still having a good uh, rounded knowledge about all the other aspects of marketing. Um, you know, almost it's, it's all for me. It's like, you know, if I were to, for instance, um, if I needed to get plumbing done in the house, um, if I hire a plumber, um, I would just have to assume he's going to know what to do. You know what I mean? I don't mm-hmm. have a clue what that guy's doing or if what he's doing is right or whatever it is. I fully trust that that person's going to know what to do. But if you're going to be a, if, if I knew a little bit about marketing or, or, or sorry, a little bit about, um, about plumbing or a little bit about putting up drywall, at least I can go either do it myself or when mm-hmm. some, I bring someone in, we'd be able to collaborate and make something even better happen. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think that's the beauty of being a jack of all trades. But nonetheless, I always try to hammer it home. You, you will always want to choose at least a few things that you want to be great at because by mm-hmm. the time by the time you retire you got to be able to say that you you're exceptional at something and it's not just because you know for vanity purposes or because you just want to say that you were great at something it's actually because you're going to feel a heck of a lot better about yourself when you say you're mm-hmm. really great at something oh yeah for sure and and i i i'm so thankful for the the generalist skills that I've picked up in the past. And, and the reason for that is context matters. Like I understand how Google at, like, it's so easy for a lot of, um, you know, younger marketers who are, you know, just starting out for, for example, in freelancing, I've talked, I talked to a bunch of people like this and, um, because Google ads, maybe all they know coming up, then they get kind of pigeonholed or tunnel visioned into Google ads, right? Mm-hmm. And and kind of lose this whole larger picture of the context of how Google ads fits into a larger marketing strategy. As much as yeah. I like to say, like, it may be true like a few years ago where, you know, you can win and, and do very well for a business if you just focus on Google ads. But nowadays, not so much. You, you have to know how all the pieces fit together and when to yeah. focus on Google ads for example, or when not to focus on Google ads. There are actually yeah. um, a few clients that I talked to and be like, Hey, um, I, I told them straight up. It's like, uh, I'm probably like, I'm probably not the best person to hire for what you need at this point, because your business goals don't align with this platform. Yeah. Yeah. You may be better going on, um, on Instagram, for example, you may be better on, um, you know, doing outreach on Reddit. And the scenario is like, if you, if you insist on doing Google ads, I can give you like the best dang job I can do to, for you, but it might not be the best fit for you in the larger picture. Yeah. I actually, I I added a point to my newsletter about, about that. It's, it's kind of like, you know, on a soccer field, you have midfield defense and, and you know, I think they're called offense. <laughs> I think they're called offense. It's been literally 25 years since I played soccer. Um, but but then you have strikers, right? And and I think of myself a little bit more like a striker because, you know, I get brought into, you know, startups at a very young age sometimes. And it's because I'm really good at being able to start a few things. So if we want to start running some some paid ad campaigns, want to start doing the right mm-hmm. social strategy, want to start going ahead and, and setting the preliminary, um, I don't know, code down for SEO. We want to start newsletters. Great. Awesome. We could definitely do that. Um, but inevitably being able to grow to the point where I can say, you know, like we really should go ahead and bring in a paid expert, you know what I mean? Name Brian, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Then, then that allows the company to grow a lot easier because at least they can go ahead and test, test different mechanisms. Like you mentioned earlier, if, if, a, if a company might do better on Instagram than a Google ad, they need to test that before they go ahead and actually right. find that Instagram is the right one to do. So that's where I kind of, I found my niche at least to be able to, to say that I, I come in early, I come in um, to test different avenues. Uh, I come in to, to figure out exactly what the, I have a product ownership background. So clearly I go through a little bit more of the business model canvas and, and I figure mm-hmm. out exactly the different aspects of user personas uh, and, and, and competition, but, but, but there's a level of, of, of there's so many levels to being a marketer that, the key sometimes is to figure out exactly which point in the journey that you want to really be good at. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I I can be such a huge nerd talking to you about this whole one topic and we can go on forever and ever. But I 
We've touched upon this a, a few times already in this conversation about your newsletter. So I find it such a huge resource and it's entertaining to read. Um, that's why I read every one of them. Uh, so can you tell us a bit about um, why you started this, uh, what your vision is for this newsletter? Yeah, sure. So I, at some point when, when you're in your career, um, and I think you, you're clearly doing this with TreeBud Academy, um, you've, you've accumulated a lot of experience, you've, you, you've met a lot of people, you've, you've accomplished a lot of things, and at some point you kind of want to give back. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I'm not trying to say that I'm suddenly like the, 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 you know, the ultimate teacher or whatever, but, but ultimately I've You're got- the Warren Buffett, the Warren Buffett and Bill Gates of, uh, of, of marketing knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I, I could dig it. I like the idea of that that might be the name of my next newsletter. I put out uh, the Warren Buffett of marketing. No, the, um, but generally like, I think there's, um, you know, like, when, when you, you reach that point, you kind of want to find a way to share, you know what I mean? And, and I find that I've, you know, I've learned a bunch of stuff. I've had some funny journeys being a marketer. And I think that there's a lot that you can share to others that are just kind of starting out their journey. Um, or maybe people that own a business and they want to, you know, figure out how to do better, uh, do better in their marketing uh, efforts. Right. So like there's, there's, there's a hole for that that's available too. I'd love to, I love to write, you know what I mean? And, and, you know, it's, it's always been part of me. Like I think one of my newsletters, I talk about how my life coach asked me a really interesting question. And it was a very, uh, I mean, like uh, if anything, it's, it's very uh, thought provoking one that said, you know, like we all, what we enjoy the most we've been doing since a child, you know what I mean? We do it in different ways. We choose our jobs. We choose our friends. We choose our hobbies based on this one type of thing that we do, you know what I mean? And, and I think I, I used to, I mentioned in the news, you know, this I was very too, but you know, when I was a kid, I used to write little novels, you know what I mean? And then, and when I was in high school, I started a, a rap group, you know what I mean? And I loved to write more than I actually liked to rap, but I liked to actually write a lot. Um, I went, and actually I went to university for computer science because I was so f- threatened by the idea of writing that I took the complete opposite program and I realized that I probably should just write anyway so then I went to marketing I I did blogging and I did a lot of like personal blogging as well as like writing for like SEO copy ad copy to to like marketing uh, newsletters to whatever it is that's required for marketing and content Um, you know I ended up writing as well too so inevitably what I like to do is write so um, you know I've I wanted to write I wanted to share my knowledge but I chose email newsletters for a few reasons. One, Substack is a fantastic platform to be able to just pick up and go. Um, like I could easily just set up a WordPress site with a MailChimp connected to it and have it all connected and go. But it doesn't really – like first off, I spend more time building the website. I spend more time designing a newsletter. This is just you pick up and, and you go and you get people to sign up. And it's a very easy uh, embedded forms and stuff. But – the idea, I, the reason why I do like email is also partly the reason why I don't really post as much on social media, because you know I, I've got I don't know three thousand plus followers on Twitter that I kind of accumulated over like the early two twenty tens, and and a lot of it is through like my you know blogging and stuff. But the I realize as I spent about nine ten months uh, locked out of my account from Twitter last year that I could bust my butt off, build like this this spent all my time on my on my the social profiles, but at the end of the day, it's someone else that owns it and someone else is like making money off of my content. Someone else is like making a lot of money off of my data. And ultimately I, I, I feel like in order to fully own your platform, there's, there's, there's only a subsection of it. One of them is, is websites and building a site that everyone goes to um, and hitting their inbox. So basically like email, you, you own your, your, your vertical, you own it completely. You can say whatever you want to it. You can, you can promote, you can, you you can do a ton of cool stuff with, with email. Um, but you know, I think that I found that as the best platform for, for me, because, um, I get to literally cover all the bases of what I'm trying to do uh, as a marketer, um, as being like a coach, if you want to call it, or if you want to call it, uh, 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 fulfilling my own personal capabilities of loving to write, um, but also owning my, owning my vertical as well. Yeah, and actually, you touch upon a a piece of advice. I I work with a few um, artists and musicians, and this is a piece of advice I give to everyone out there. And if you are an artist or musician, uh, definitely take this to heart because um, the the scenario right now is, let's say you're on Spotify, YouTube, you know, your Instagram, 
Twitter, what have you. I always tell these people, like these people, that in order to to really own your property, you need to carve out your own exi- like existence on the internet. Um, yep. Because whatever you do, you're going to be at the mercy of like if these are your main channels of interacting with your fans and your followers, um, you're at the mercy of their algorithms. Right. Absolutely. So you don't technically own your voice or own your reach in your audience, uh, which is this exact same point that you were just talking about. What I tell them is now flip it around, right? Use YouTube, um, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, Facebook as discovery platforms for Mm -hmm. new fans to discover you and drive them to your websites or your, you know, even Spotify, right? You're at the mercy of the Mm -hmm. Spotify algorithm. If they choose to close your account because of like some uh, really sus type of uh, list, you know, downloads or listens, then you're, you're, you're screwed, right? You're SOL. Absolutely. Can't do anything about it. Um, So having your own website and that's the platform that if you kind of condition your audience and your followers to that's, the website is your main form of um, contact uh, and that's how they can reach you, get the latest content, then all the better. Because then now you you own that algorithm. Whatever you want to push is available on that website. So I, I applaud you because um, you're executing on something that I've always wanted to do and just never got around to it. <laughs> owning my own piece of like owning my yeah. voice. Um, Yeah. And I will say, actually, you make a good point about that. And I want to add one more uh, point to that as well. Um, I think I don't remember where I heard this stuff. I I feel like pick up knowledge and I just wish that I put a footnote in my brain exactly where I came from. But there was a certain point where somebody I read somewhere, uh, maybe I was at a marketing conference where um, and we're going to get into brain neurology at this point. But the the. We, we're, we're conditioned to just focus on seven websites that we go to. And I don't know why, but it's there's, it's partially the reason why phone numbers are seven digits because our brain is stuck with seven for some reason. Now, like, but if we're talking about like, uh, you know, internet usage, for instance, right? And going on the internet and going on websites, people generally have seven primary websites that they go to. You know what I mean? Um, unfortunately, Google, Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever you choose as that medium already takes up the majority of those. And I, I, and that kind of leaves us to literally say either, either you build the next Forbes.com, which is never going to happen in most cases, um, or you, you become really big on those other platforms and you push your content there. And again, they own the content when you do it, but I mean, inevitably that if you want to chase where the chase, where the people are, like they're, they're on those top six, seven sites, whatever that most people are using. So for that reason, that's why I found an email inbox is a lot better to connect with people. Some people might find SMS marketing. Some people might find LinkedIn. The news feed might be better. Some people might find Twitter just tweeting things to be the way to do it. And, and or even just WhatsApp, because obviously WhatsApp as a business is also really good too. But the, the inevitably there's, 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 I think I, I remember from, I was watching a, uh, an event last year and uh, one of the one of the people mentioned too that um when you they you know, they asked him uh, it was a web series festival and the uh, for one of my clients and so what happened was they asked them do you think there are ever going to be another genre focused uh video platform so is there ever going to be a funny or die is there ever going to be a college humor website and you know they asked the industry executives and they said nope Nope, there's never going to be another one because everyone's on YouTube, everyone's on Twitch, everyone's on social platforms, everyone's on TikTok, everyone's on like whatever it is that's current right now. And that's where they're, that's where all the content will be housed now. There's never going to be a website that's separate that people go to because literally at this point, everyone's just going to go on those social platforms now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's so hard to like break through and, and get people's attention and, yeah. um, and you bring out a few few platforms, and which is probably a great segue into this debate that that's always been happening. Just give me one second. I got a problem with this. Ah, <laughs> uh, one of my favorite books, Confessions. Oh. So this book, I highly recommend to anyone who like who is just curious about advertising. Or um, uh, I read this every two three years. This is my third time. I'm like. 
Amazing. I've read it like three times. I am uh, this far into this current uh, iteration of reading this book. Um, and in there, um, David Ogilvy talks about um, the difference between short copy and long copy. Yep. So, you know, modernizing this type of co um, conversation, what do you think about, you know, on the topic of getting people's attention? What do you think about short form content versus long form content? So like the TikTok versus the, you know, two hour or hour and a half long podcast. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think is, um, is better or, or what's your viewpoint on this? I say that they're all right. The, and the reason why they're all right is because, you know, if, if you think about it in the sixties, your content was delegated to either whatever they say on the radio or the 50 ish news pieces that they might put in the newspaper and you sit there and you read it. And that's basically all whatever. That was literally the only content you got. And then the TV came out and then the internet came out. And then like in the past few years, past decade, people noticed that, okay, well, there's just an absurd amount of content being pumped into the internet. Right. And so it, you know, the difficulty is that there's like, I can't, I don't know the numbers in front of me right now, but clearly there's just billions and billions and billions of data uploaded to the internet every few minutes. Right. And so because of that, um, you know, there's more content than ever to, to be digested, but we still only have 24 hours a day to, in order to consume it. So that's why initially people are like, okay, well, just let's just keep it shorter. You know what I mean? And that's why Twitter became really good because within 160 characters, you could put out a message. And, and that was that was something that worked really well. Um, but as we started to reach a point now where we're really, all of us are so inundated by content, and then marketers are spending different ways to interrupt. And I, I wrote a blog post about 10 years ago about interrupting and how it's like, you know, we shouldn't interrupt. You know what I mean? And part of the reason why is because it just, it's it's like, it's a, you know, you watch TV and the, the ads are just trying to like, just get super ridiculous and they're just loud and yelling. And it's just, it gets obnoxious because we're already in, uh, saturated by all that type of content. So now when we're talking about short-term and long-form content, short-form and long-term, long-form content, I say it works for anyone because we've now reached a point where it just depends on what you want to do as an individual. If you're the type of person that wants to read a book and screw social media, you can go ahead and read a book and you can go ahead and read a Kobo if you want. You can go ahead and just, you know, if, if you don't have time to sit and read a book, but you do drive an hour to work every day, well, before pandemic, then chances are you would probably hit the hit Audible. And honestly, I've crushed a lot of audible books that way right um, because it's a fantastic way to to fill that gap in time with more content now the, that same thing goes for podcasts you know what i mean people love to listen to the two-hour podcast but as you know as a as, as a as a content creator that when you record a one-hour podcast and joe rogan did this really well on youtube is that he'll put a full one-hour podcast online but then he'll cut out individual five minute segments of where, where his guest might've said something, maybe Elon Musk, maybe smoked a dude, but you know what I mean? But he would cut it out and then upload it with those keyword terms for anyone that's looking for a certain type of thing. And that's why short form and long form work. It's because there's a demographic of people that want to sit there and watch an hour long podcast and that there's nothing wrong with that. There's also another demographic of people that want to watch six, uh, five minute videos. You know what I mean? And literally that that's, what makes them feel they want to do it. And that's fine too. The, the, the content, regardless of the length is dependent on, on the, the recipient. And that's why like, uh, like for instance, my newsletter is three days a week. You know what I mean? And I think that for some, if that's like, Whoa, you know what I mean? Even, even originally when I started, it was supposed to be five a week. Right. But I was like, you know what? I want my life back. So I want to, I just scaled it back to three, but there's certain people, there's a demographic for that. There's a lot of people that don't want to get three emails a week and that's fine. I, I, you can go ahead and my website once a week or something like that and read it. Uh, I'm not trying to really bombard your newsletter, but there is a demographic of people that love those daily newsletters. You could see it by uh, the hustle, um, you know, the daily stoic. There's a lot of daily newsletters, um, daily email services and, and, and where they're providing value on a daily basis. And it's specifically for those people that have five minutes on the toilet or like, you know, they, maybe they just have a couple minutes break. They want to, they want to chill and just read something. Then that's what, uh, that's what those, those, those short form emails are for. 
But then at the same time, um, and not to take us a little bit away from the purpose for it, but the idea is that long form and short form content was also dictated by Google because Google's SEO algorithm was choosing evergreen long form content over short posts. Um, and so for that reason, long posts got more preference because of the fact that they give uh, preference towards posts that are older, uh, posts that are longer and have more keywords and generally have more traffic going to it. So. Uh, Google does have something to do with with whether long form or short term short form works, but it just depends on the 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 the, the, the person. Now, one last thing to note, you know, TikTok is like what the uh, like short clips, you know, video clips. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I don't know too much about TikTok. I do know, it, but from a from a from from what everyone else knows for that matter. But it's still in its infancy in that sort of way, where people are still trying to understand the platform and how it works. But but you know, there was TikTok a few years ago. It was called Vine. You know what I mean? And and, and like. The difference is that I'm not sure why Twitter shut down Vine. I, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not into that idea, trying to figure out why. But maybe that that demographic just wasn't there just yet. The demographics here now. I've watched so many six second, ten second clips <laughs> like lately than ever before. But maybe it just has to do with the recipient, and the recipient exists today versus it, it didn't maybe exist as as easily, you know, six years ago. Yeah, I think um, it, you're 100 percent right. It all it. <laughs> Marketing 101, it always comes back to your audience, right? Um, always. You can have audiences that you can cater short form content to and they love it. They eat it all up. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's great that you touch upon the Joe Rogan po podcast, um, Joe, Joe Rogan Experience podcast. Um, I'm actually modeling my content creation and strategy behind him uh, where I have my Monday minutes where it's just literally a couple minutes long. Um, I recap things that I learned from the previous week. Uh, Tuesday, I'm kind of flip-flopping between tutorial videos versus like short clips of the previous week's episode, full episode. And then yeah. Thursdays, I, I release the full episodes. Um, and the way I, I explain it to people with this strategy, and this was another freebie for, for YouTube content um, creators for growth, is again, it's discovery, right? The short form content, it's low commitment and get people, um, you know, if it's interesting, they'll be able to discover your content much more quickly and easily. Um, so the tutorial videos and the short clips have very, you know, catchy titles to get people on the search results. Um, the longer form content is then there once they're in, they come in, they see that, you know, what other content does this, this guy have? Um, and if they want to sink their teeth into like more meaty content, it's there for them to consume. Um, Again, my channel is still in its infancy and uh, it's grown okay um, at, a, a, at a steady pace. So I, I hope I'm doing something right. So only time will tell. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll throw in a nugget just for us since we're talking YouTube tips. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you might know this already, but I'll just share it anyway. Um, every YouTube channel, well, successful YouTube channel, has a handful of videos that they call lead magnets, subscriber magnets. It'll be the one video that for whatever reason, it gets recommended a lot by YouTube and gets you a lot of of subscribers. Like a lot of people watch mm -hmm. it, then they go ahead and subscribe. You have no idea what video that'll be. You have to literally let the demographic figure out what that is. But if you can go ahead and figure out, put keep putting out content, don't stop. Just, just keep putting out mm -hmm. content. Inevitably, one of them will stick. And when you get the one that sticks, add it to the end of every single video as an end screen card. Mm -hmm. And that will, what it'll do is all your future videos or even your past videos, if you add it there, um, when they see that end screen video with the video that gets people to go ahead and subscribe to your to your channel a lot they'll most likely click it go to your lead magnet the chance that you get a subscriber out of it so it's a it's a cool technique to to, to release to, to to scale but also again like you said it's all about audience you know what i mean the audience mm -hmm. will dictate what happens yeah i'm i'm kind of figuring out my end card and and for me actually one of my best performing videos was uh a video tutorial on how to create an ad campaign in under 45 minutes. Um, I'll put it up mm. in the sort of info card. Um, got a ton of views and half of those views were just me like messaging people who expressed interest in that tutorial video. And it's like, Hey, the video's up. Right. Uh, yeah. Almost 200 of those views were just me, you know, replying to people on Twitter. And I'm so, I'm so yeah. thankful yeah. for the, um, for the support and all the views that people are, um, uh, are actually watching that long content. Um, and 
I, I might experiment, keep experimenting with uh, with maybe putting that into the end card. So thank you for that. Yeah, I, it, it worked really. It worked really well for the specifically the one client I have. We found a lead magnet, and it actually drove twenty to twenty five percent of all the watch time and views for the whole channel and the whole channel's got like 200 videos but that one is a juggernaut it literally had to do with lowering your bitcoin fees and that's something that everyone wants to know and that's primarily why that one gets just every week at least five to ten subscribers from that video alone now the idea with that is that once you find it i we dropped it in the end of every single one of those end cards and i swear like the the, the impressions we got from that channel just within the span of two months like it went from i think three thousand to 2,500 to 3,000 um, views a, a, a month to 4,500 in December to 6,000 we're expecting by the end of January. Um, and it's all just by finding that one lead magnet. That's all it is. Sorry, I cut you off really if you want to go ahead. No, no worries. Um, I, I think you put into words and you articulated what I've kind of like my gut knew already. Uh, but never really like fully fleshed out or fully formed into a, an idea or something actionable. So thank you for that. I I think that's, I'm going to start going through all my videos and uh, figuring out if there's uh, a play there in terms of tweaking, um, tweaking in the new videos. Um, I think we can uh, sign off by this question. I always ask my, uh, my guests, uh, knowing what you know now, What's one piece of advice you'd give yourself or the version of yourself that is just starting on this entrepreneurial journey? So there's a few, uh, you know, the one, it's funny when you say one thing, because I agree, there's always just the one thing you want to share. But I swear, if I had a chance to talk to my young self, it would be a whole book worth of stuff to tell them. <laughs> but the the things that I would most likely say is like, you know, don't be afraid to learn things. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's some weird fallacy or that, you know, like we... You know, oh, you know, like my my brain's dead. I just want to chill out and do nothing, play video games. That's fine. You could do that. But I mean, your brain isn't just limited to the amount that you feel like you want to learn. It's actually, it actually can learn more than you think that it can. So if we get over the idea, and if I could tell my younger self that just get over the idea that, you know what, if you're feeling burned out, it's okay. You still have more to your brain than you realize. You know what I mean? Then there's an opportunity to learn new things. And if I learned those new things that I did you know, in my, my late twenties and I learned that stuff in my late, you know, teens, then that would have, that would have significantly changed a lot of the way that I perceive, um, not just marketing, but just, you know, life in general. Um, but you know, I, I, on a very separate, separate note, I want, I wish I'd give financial advice to my young self. <laughs> so I, I, I just, if there's one thing, really, I just want to say, manage your money better. You know what I mean? Cause I swear, man, like that's one thing that they do not teach in school. And I really wish that they did. Um, because, because, you know, um, there's, when it comes to understanding RSPs and TFSAs, and it's just a scary world dealing with taxes and dealing with like, you know, the CRA, but, but you know what, once you understand it, once you figure it out, once you have someone to tell you about it, um, and how it works and the benefits of it and being able to understand the idea of being able to put money aside, but it's not just putting money aside to an RSP. It's actually you can put money aside towards things you actually have control over, like your, you know, financial portfolio that, if there's a way to figure that out at a younger age, I think we wouldn't have so much problem with like student debt, with credit card debt, with with loans. We would all be able to buy houses a heck of a lot sooner. Um, and and just in general, there's there's a there's a there's a big gap in the market. Well, at least in the the, the learning institutions, where I wish I could tell my younger self, this is how you manage your money. Well, thank you for that, and I think um, I, I'm. I have my fingers crossed, but I don't know how how solid this is going to be. I'm going to start inviting some um, pretty senior executives in in the financial um, in some financial institutes. Um, I have a very good friend who is well connected there. Um, he said he might have a few guests um, you know, pointed my way, so I, I'd love to be able to share some of those conversations with you with everybody who's watching. Um, and I think you and I have a lot to talk about, uh, about rap music and hip hop <laughs> yeah. culture. Yeah. And I think that could be a wonderful conversation next time about, mm -hmm. um, business and hip hop and, and, um, 
and the whole uh, culture behind uh, this music genre. Um, yeah, definitely. I'd love to come back and do that. Absolutely. That'd be cool. If we can both just geek out and nerd out on, um, and dude, Eminem has been busy during this pandemic. Oh yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I can tell you just from, and you know, I caught, I don't know the name of that. Look, I'm a big Eminem fan. I think he's one of the greatest of all time easily, especially when you talk in lyricism oh, and talk down. about putting emotion into music. There's, and Rap God in a more recent kind of vein is a fantastic. One of the greatest songs he's put out. Um, he did put out a song for the UFC, like I think a few days ago or something, which I'll mm-hmm. admit I'm not a fan of. Um, but I do think that people go crazy when he starts rapping something inspirational. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. when he starts inspiring people, like lose yourself, it just gives chills all over here. You know, like it's it's incredible. But I mean, I could talk lyrics and lyricism like forever. I, I and just you know, like I've, I've I used to be the only. Well, technically, I, uh, you know, I was one of the only colored kids in my elementary school. And by colored, I mean so anyone that's just literally not Caucasian, right? And and mm-hmm. I, I remember I was just saying it yesterday. I used to be the first person to walk around and say, sup, fool? <laughs> sup, fool? And then I was like grade six or something like that. And everyone's like, what are you saying? And I was like, yeah, it's because I just happened to find out about Snoop Dogg. Because where I'm from, they didn't have a rap section. They didn't have an R&B section. They didn't have mm-hmm. any black sections at all in, in the record store. So like I had to get my music from my best friend who got it from a tape that he recorded from his friend that was in California. You know what I mean? That's how I heard first about rap, right? And and like, you know, it where I come from, it's definitely not a not a mainstream thing. And, and it was very much something that was almost vilified. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that uh, obviously things have changed a lot. You know, there's a lot of pop culture involved with it, but, but just in general, there's fantastic, fantastic um, um, uh, like rappers that are out um, more so back in the nineties and the two thousands, maybe these days are a little bit less lyrical, but, but I do like my trap music once in a while. That's for sure. Yeah. And I think maybe the next, the next video's title could be like counterculture and entrepreneurship. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, you know, there's there's always overlaps, man. Like just in general, like I was I was recording CDs on my CD burner um, with the guys. We had we had five of well six of us total, but we had a big rap group, six of us, and and we recorded three albums. We toured all over the, the Maritimes from Halifax to to Fredericton to St. John, wherever we sent a demo in the universal, and, you know, they, they expressed interest and just didn't work out. Cause we were all mostly just a bunch of crappy teenagers <laughs> that didn't know how to organize anything. But, but, you know, we, we literally were entrepreneurs ourselves. We were actually recording uh, songs in the studio. We built our own studio. We, we recorded everything ourselves. We made our own beats. We put our stuff on our own CDs and we used my CD burner to burn those CDs. We, we create, we got a, we created the, the artwork ourselves. We sold that stuff 20 bucks a pop. And, you know, it, it was fun. Like that was my first taste, if anything, of, of, of really, um, entrepreneurship, um, and in some ways marketing as well too, technically word of mouth, but, but, you know, like that, that was exciting. We had a website, because, I mean, that this is a whole other story about my, my, my past years as a, as a, as someone that um, dabbled in IRC and dabbled in like you know, um, like things things that things that um, that involve the internet, but but not so much the the mainstream side of the internet. Um, back in the '90s, it was a heck of a lot more fun, ICQ bombing and like you know like whatever it is that we did, but. Just you know, I got a free domain, and we had a we had a domain for our website, and 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 I don't think a lot of rap groups had a website back in the '90s, let alone in a place that where where they did not like rap. So it was a I, I don't know. Life is always a challenge in in terms of the journey that we create, and and I think that sometimes we can never feel discouraged by the choices we make because as long as we're making the right choices and the choices that's best for ourselves, but as well as for everybody. Um, sometimes a journey may seem tough, but inevitably it's always worth at the end of the day. A hundred percent. Like, like our first topic, you know, many paths to find a destination. So whatever path you're on, uh, sometimes it's just keep going. Sometimes it's pivot and turn around. So whatever it may be, um, just enjoy the journey. Thank you so much for this amazing, amazing conversation. And I can't wait to talk more and geek out with you on uh, hip hop and hear more about your stories of, as a, as a rap group, as part of a rap yeah, group thanks, in man. the Maritimes. Yeah, man, right. definitely. I'd love to come back sometime. And thanks for having me. We can chat anything about 
you know, about music, talk about marketing. We can even talk about, you know, like just the fact of, you know, the contrasting differences where, you know, you grew up, uh, you know, as, as an Asian guy in, in Toronto and I'm an Asian guy in St. John. There's lots of stuff we could talk about. I oh, can't yeah. wait to come back. Thanks again, man. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And take care. See ya. Hi, Brian here. Thank you so much for watching to the very end. I'd love to have your feedback, so please like or dislike the video with the buttons below. Comment and let me know how I can improve my content or if you have any questions. I'm so excited to have Reggie back on for another episode, so please subscribe and hit the notification bell so you're alerted when Reggie's back on for the next episode. So stay tuned.